Ramadan and hello to all. Really great pleasure to be uh, with you and happy holidays to all celebrating Ramadan, Easter and, and, and Passover. Um, I, I, I want to start by uh, um, bringing back the reports that we heard from Jerusalem, Masafar Yatta and Jordan Valley to mind. Uh, and also the analysis from Yuad about uh, the psychological effects of home demolitions. And of course, uh, Omar's brilliant overview, historical overview of the Nakba and, and the ongoing role of the Jewish National Fund. Uh, and allow me to add just a little bit to this picture, uh, beginning from uh, the turn of this year, 2022, in January, Amal Nakhle turned 18 in Israeli prison. He has been held without charge or trial since January 2021. This is his second time he is held in arbitrary detention for a prolonged period. He was 16 the first time. He was at the height of COVID pandemic. He was kept away from his family in torturous circumstances, despite him suffering also from a chronic neuromuscular disease. The following month in February, 13-year-old Muhammad Rizq Salah was killed by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank. He was shot with live ammunition in the torso when he was standing approximately eight, uh, 100 meters away from the separation wall that Israel has built to segregate Palestinians and take away land. After Muhammad was injured, uh, he was lying on the ground. Israeli forces approached him and removed his clothes. And according to video footage that was taken after the foot, foot shooting, Israeli forces prevented a Palestinian ambulance from reaching Muhammad. He remained on the ground for around 13 minutes before soldiers put him on a stretcher and carried him away. At least eight Palestinian children have been killed by Israeli forces since the beginning of this year. The day before Muhammad was killed, Israeli authorities demolished homes of the Palestinians in Al Araqib village in the Bir Saba desert, Naqab Negev desert in southern Israel. It was the 198th time that the homes in Al Araqib are demolished by the Israeli authorities. There are now, and we've heard, more than 37 communities live in what is called unrecognized villages in the Naqab, denied basic services like water, electricity, roads, schools, and homes and livelihood structures are frequently demolished by Israeli forces. When I was there earlier this year, I spoke to a kid on the ruins of his uh, house. He pointed to me where his old room was, and I asked him how he feels about this. He said, we're just waiting for the next demolition in our village. Today, and we've heard about this, we see the brutality in Jenin and in Jerusalem, the collective punishment, the attack on worshippers in Al-Aqsa, the restriction on Easter celebrations, the use of special forces to detain and torture children, while at the same time, Jewish Israeli extremists are allowed to demonstrate and protest and call for a new Nakba. Indeed, the Nakba has not ended. In June this year, Gaza will close 15 years of being under a brutal military blockade that amounts to collective punishment. 45% of the population in Gaza are children under the age of 15. These children have experienced five devastating military offensives in which hundreds of children have been killed. Those who continue to survive are locked in a place that is inhabitable, according to the UN. No clean water, no electricity, no adequate health healthcare, massive poverty, and etc. Palestinian organizations that document and report on these violations and others that try to alleviate the suffering are attacked by the Israeli authorities, including by designating them as terrorists. For example, most of the information that I just presented to you comes from Defense for Children International in Palestine, which has been designated as a terrorist organization in October last year, basically criminalizing them for the human rights work that they do. The violations I just listed and many more this elimination of childhood of Palestinians and the attempt to silence those who report on them are all symptoms of Israel's oppression and domination against Palestinians. The reflections of deep patterns that have been going ongoing for decades, linked together in a system that can only be called one thing, apartheid. It is an ongoing crime against humanity and Amnesty International, as well as others, has documented, researched and reported on this crime. On the 1st of February uh, of this year, we published the report, Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, Cruel System of Domination and a Crime Against Humanity. With the publication of this report, we have completed a consensus among civil society organizations working on the human rights situation in Israel and Palestine that Israel is perpetrating the crime against humanity of apartheid. 
very important to note here that this work would not have been possible without the leadership and pioneering work of Palestinian organizations who started using this legal framework and this course for over two decades. In March, this consensus grew into the UN with a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in the OPT, Professor Michael Link, also producing a report that finds that Israel is perpetrating the crime against humanity of apartheid against Palestinians. About the amnesty report, the report finds that since its establishment in 1948, Israel has pursued the policy of establishing and maintaining Jewish demographic hegemony and maximizing its control over land to benefit Jewish Israelis while restricting the rights of Palestinians and preventing Palestinian refugees from returning to their homes. In 1967, Israel extended this policy to the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which has been under military, Israel's military occupation ever since. Amnesty has analyzed Israel's intent to create and maintain a system of oppression and domination over Palestinians and examined its key components. It's territorial fragmentation, segregation and control, dispossession of land and property, and denial of economic and social rights. In the report, Amnesty concludes that this system amounts to apartheid. The report also includes documentation of unlawful acts committed by Israel against Palestinians with the intent to maintain this system, including forcible transfers. And under this, is, is, uh, forcible transfers is an umbrella that within it, there are home demolitions, forced evictions, and the creation of coercive environments that lead to the forcible displacement of Palestinians. So forcible transfers is one of the unlawful acts perpetrated to maintain uh, the system of oppression and domination of apartheid. Arbitrary detention and torture is the second. Unlawful killings is the third and the denial of basic rights or persecution is the fourth. Amnesty concludes that such acts form part of a systematic as well uh, as a widespread attack directed against the Palestinian population and amount to the crime against humanity of apartheid. In the report, we assess that almost all of Israel's civilian administration and military authorities, as well as government and quasi-governmental institutions, such as the Jewish National Fund, are involved in the enforcement of the system of apartheid against Palestinians across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and against Palestinian refugees and their descendants outside of this territory. The totality of the regime of laws, policies, and practices that we describe in the report demonstrates that Israel has established and maintained an institutionalized regime of oppression and domination of the Palestinian population for the benefit of Jewish Israelis, a system of apartheid, wherever it has exercised control over Palestinians' lives since 1948. Amnesty concludes that the state of Israel considers and treats Palestinians as an inferior non-Jewish racial group. The segregation is conducted in a systematic and highly institutionalized manner through laws, policies, and practices, all of which are intended to prevent Palestinians from claiming and enjoying equal rights to Jewish Israelis within the territory of Israel and the OPT and thus are intended to oppress and dominate the Palestinian people. This has been complemented by a legal regime that controls by negating the rights of Palestinian refugees residing outside of Israel and the OPT from return. Dismantling this cruel system of apartheid is essential for the millions of Palestinians who continue to live in Israel and occupy Palestinian territories, as well as for the return of Palestinian refugees who remain displaced in neighboring countries often within 100 kilometers of their original homes so that they can enjoy their human rights free from discrimination. The scale and seriousness of the violations documented make it clear that the international community needs to urgently and drastically change its approach to the human rights crisis in Israel and Palestine and recognize the full extent of the crimes that Israel perpetrates against the Palestinian people. Indeed, for over seven, seven decades, the international community has stood by as Israel has been given free reign to dispossess, segregate, control, oppress, and dominate Palestinians. The numerous UN Security Council resolutions adopted over the years remain unimplemented, with Israel facing no repercussions for actions that have violated international law, apart from some condemnations that we hear every now and then. Meanwhile, Addressing Israeli violations against Palestinians in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip, merely within the framework of international humanitarian law and, and separately from the violations perpetrated against Palestinians in Israel, 
has failed to tackle the root causes of the conflict and achieve any form of accountability and justice for the victims. Without taking any meaningful action to hold Israel to account for its systematic and widespread violations and crimes under international law against the Palestinians, the international community has contributed to undermining the international legal order and has emboldened Israel to continue perpetrating the crimes with impunity. In fact, some states have actively supported Israel's violation by supplying it with arms, equipment, and other tools to perpetrate crimes under international law and by providing diplomatic cover, including at the UN, to shield it from accountability. By doing so, they have completely failed the Palestinian people and have only exacerbated uh, Palestinians' lived experience as people with lesser rights and inferior status to Jewish Israelis. While ultimately change can only come from within Israel and Palestine, the international community can take concrete action to pressure Israel into dismantling apartheid. The crime against humanity of apartheid entails individual international criminal responsibility, which applies to individuals, members of organizations, and representatives of the state who participate in its commission. Thus, Israel itself, the Palestinian authorities, the international community, and the International Criminal Court should all investigate the commission of the crime of apartheid under international law. All states may, may exercise universal jurisdiction over all persons reasonably suspected of committing the crime of apartheid. The UN Security Council must ensure that perpetrators of the crime against humanity of apartheid and other crimes under international law in Israel and OPT are brought to justice. And the UN Security Council must also impose targeted sanctions, such as asset freezes against Israeli officials most implicated in the crime, and a comprehensive arms embargo on Israel. At the same time, the UN General Assembly should re-establish the Special Committee Against Apartheid, which was originally established in November 1962, to focus on all situations, including in Israel and occupied Palestinian territories, where the serious human rights violation and crime against humanity of apartheid are being committed, and bring pressure to those responsible to disestablish the system of oppression and domination. All governments and regional actors, particularly those who enjoy close diplomatic relations with Israel, such as the United States, the European Union and its member states, the United Kingdom, but also states that are in the process of strengthening their ties, such as Arab and African states, must not support the system of apartheid or render aid or assistance to maintaining such a regime and cooperate to bring an end to this unlawful situation. As a first step, they must recognize that Israel is committing the crime of apartheid and other international crimes and use all political and diplomatic tools to ensure Israeli authorities implement the recommendations that Amnesty International is putting forward and other organizations are putting forward. Amnesty is also reiterating its long standing call on states to immediately suspend the direct and indirect supply, sale or transfer of all weapons, munitions and other military and security equipment including the provision of training and other military and security assistance. It's also calling on state to enforce a ban on products from Israeli settlements. Businesses, too, have a responsibility to assess their activities in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories and ensure that they do not contribute to or benefit from the system of apartheid and address such impact when it occurs and sees relevant activities if it cannot be prevented. And this is a recommendation that is targeted at JCB. Uh, and, 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 and really very important to, to uh, highlight uh, the great work that Amnesty United Kingdom, UK, and, and uh, ICAT are doing to end JCB's involvement and complicity and hold the company accountable. This is really crucial work in dismantling Israel's apartheid against Palestinians. At the end, and reflecting back on the reports and analysis that we've heard at the beginning of this conference, uh, a crucial part of Israel's apartheid is denying Palestinians a home. To dismantle apartheid, we need to think as follows. Protect Palestinian homes, rebuild Palestinian homes, and have Palestinians return home. Home connects the fragments, the experience, and guides the struggle. The theory of change is clear. Make it more politically and economically costly for Israel to continue on with its system of apartheid, at the same time, support those on the ground, Palestinians and Israelis, fighting against it. ICAD has been doing brilliant work over the years. It continues to be very well positioned to deliver in collaboration of, with others on this theory of change. So at the end, I want to wish you all much more power, a lot more strength, 
and thank you for the crucial work that you have been doing over so many years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sala. It's great to have you with us. And let's see, um, Richard, has anything been put into the chat line? I'm asking Richard Barnes if there's any questions or comments for Sala today, please. There's, there's only one comment that's been made. I mean, it's a, a tremendous presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and the comment was, what I'm hearing is similar, actually worse than what is happening in Ukraine and China and India stand by. So that, that's just a comment that was made. Um, can I, can I ask? Uh, uh, if I may, just on this comment, I think it's very yes, important please. because it's very telling. Um, it, it is not uh, in, in comparison, but I think what's important, I mean, reflecting on this comment is that Israel is held to a much lower standard than China, India, and, and other countries that violate international law and commit crimes against humanity. And I think this is very important to highlight. Israel is always saying that it is singled out, that it is treated differently when it comes to, for example, the Human Rights Council and by human rights organizations and others. And indeed, this is the case because it is singled out by being held to much lower standard. It's singled out because international law does not apply when it comes to Israel. It's singled out because it is undermining the international legal order. So I, I think it's a very important comment. I just wanted to say this very quickly. Thanks. Sorry, Richard. Go on. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. Uh, the question I was going to ask was how, how you feel and how Amnesty feels about how the report on apartheid has been disseminated, how it's been used and so on. I mean, one little example I'd use, and I, I'm sure lots of, lots of people in, in, in this conference will agree, the, the Guardian, which is the liberal newspaper within the UK, talked about the report in a very small report on about page 35. It had one editorial on probably the 2nd of February and absolutely nothing since. So the question is, is that typical and how do you feel that the report has been received? Uh, unfortunately, yes. I'll, I'll also mention that the New York Times has, has only mentioned our report. If the Guardian did it in one paragraph, uh, the New York Times did it in one sentence uh, weeks after the report was published. Um, and it, it described it wrongly as being an outlier in describing that the system applies from the river to the sea. Uh, wrongly because Palestinians are using uh, uh, the same, uh, they use the, fr the framework similarly and also B'Tselem. Uh, the Israeli, one of the leading Israeli human rights organizations, has also described a system that is from the river to the sea. So also, when the New York Times was reporting it, it was reporting it uh, uh, wrongly. Um, uh, I, I look at the reactions in, 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 in two ways. Um, uh, one that is uh, at the level of uh, governments um, and, of course, the mainstream media. And then, uh, uh, on, on, on another hand, it's uh, the wider civil society uh, across the world. Uh, and I say this because, you know, as, as Linda was saying, I was traveling around. I was in Africa, in Southern, uh, South Africa, in Senegal. I was doing events um, uh, that were organized in Ireland. I was speaking to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia yesterday. We hear a lot of reports from our sections around the world, in, in, in Chile, in Uruguay, in other places that the reception has been tremendous. Um, it, there is very positive engagement by civil society organizations, by non-mainstream media, on social media, by parliamentarians uh, all around the world that are seeing uh, this as a very important analysis, uh, crucial work, uh, a very professional documentation of the crime, and really with put together with the other reports from Human Rights Watch, from the Israeli organizations, and of course, the work over many years that Palestinian human rights organizations have been doing as a turning point, as an opportunity that we have now uh, to start speaking uh, uh, or describing the situation for what it is, uh, so that we're able to address it as it is, structural discrimination, uh, structural racism, structural violence, and not only just really deal with the symptoms uh, of all of this. So uh, we're seeing great opportunities open up, perhaps more in the global south, uh, I must say, uh, than in, for example, Europe and North America. 
But that's not to say that there are really great, great uh, uh, things that are happening, including in our sections. Our sections uh, in the UK, uh, uh, for example, is, uh, is leading the way, really inspiring others in terms of kind of the work that they're doing uh, in Ireland, similarly, in other uh, EU member states. Uh, this is a long-term campaign. They recognize that, unfortunately, yes, that this is a long-term work to dismantle Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, but they recognize it as such, and they have this big breath to continue uh, on the work. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Salah. Thank you, Richard. We're, I Can know I, that I... Oh yeah, so, quickly. Sorry, sorry, very, very quickly, because I wanted, I was listening to, uh, uh, and, and I want to say this brilliant conference, uh, uh, really. Uh, and I, I heard uh, the first segment and there was a criticism uh, by a Palestinian colleague of the report uh, that said um, that it was uh, shallow and perhaps uh, limited in its analysis. Um, and uh, indeed, um, uh, settler colonialism is not a framework. Uh, that you find in Amnesty's report. Um, but settler colonialism should not be seen, uh, settler colonialism and apartheid should not be seen as mutually ex exclusive. There is no apartheid without colonialism. You know, we have the word, we have the system that crime has been codified in the context of colonialism. So this is the larger context, indeed. Uh, but what Amnesty as a human rights organization does is focuses on what is practical. Uh, apartheid as a legal framework has, I want to say, teeth. It has uh, remedies that are provided. It, there's the Convention on the Suppression of, uh, and, and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid. It's a crime against humanity that is described in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, it is condemned in international human rights law. Uh, there are ways to tackle apartheid, perhaps more visible, more approachable than colonialism, which is treated on the international law, but not in a similar way. So the other thing that is very important to highlight is that with apartheid and seeing who the duty bearer is, uh, Israel here is responsible as the state within all its institutions uh, for the crime against humanity of apartheid. There's a clear uh, criminal liability that we can establish here, and this is very crucial and important. So uh, it's great that People expect a lot from, from an organization like Amnesty, uh, but uh, it, it is uh, sometimes beyond Amnesty uh, to also address uh, politics, to address history, uh, and, and, and to give context that Palestinians you know, wish to have, and I'm, I'm speaking as a Palestinian, right? Uh, in, in, in their context, in, the, in their discourse, sorry. So yeah, 